So we, we don't have a specific risk management process. Um, it's embedded and interwoven in the way we manage money. So our approach to managing money is what we call 3M. So we look at the management of a company, we look at the moat or competitive advantage of that business, and then we look for a margin of safety, that's the third M. Margin of safety means we don't want to pay more than what we think the company is worth. So we, fo we follow exactly the same process when we're doing credit, which means when we're lending money effectively to companies, so corporate credit. That's your other area, generally your other risky area. Once again, we only lend to companies that we think have got good management teams, there's some kind of competitive advantage and we want a fair rate. When you're lending our clients money, you must be sure you're going to get the money back. So by applying our 3M process consistently on all assets which we invest in, there's very little risk because you're really investing in high quality and you're not overpaying. The last bit of the puzzle is to um, diversify. So especially in our lower risk funds, we won't have pockets or concentrations of risk um, and we'll monitor that. So that will be actively monitored. Um, but if you're diversified and you've got diversified exposure to high quality instruments, not overvalued, there's very little risk in that in the longer term. So the positioning in the funds, it's actually posed a great opportunity for us because as the resource stocks have recovered, our exposure has reduced quite a bit in that sector. So it's always nice when there's another crisis somewhere because it opportunities it opens opportunities, specifically those margin of safety. So a lot of our high quality financial companies became available at prices that they haven't been for a long time. So we actually invested a lot of money in those few days after the, the Nene issue. Um, we bought a lot of domestic banks. So my first grand net bank of mutual discovery. So we had exposure to a few of them. We were increasing significantly and some of them were introduced for the first time. It opened a brief opportunity in listed property where we haven't been for a long time and then in government bonds. So what's effectively being priced in at the moment in our, is in our government bonds is junk status already. And that's not that hard to work out. You can go and look what are the, the spreads and the swaps. Effectively, what is the cost of insuring against a credit event of the South African government, how does that, that compare to countries and um, companies that are already junk status and we are priced accordingly. So we are pricing in junk effectively. We don't think junk status is a done deal at all. Um, so effectively there's a mispricing in our government bonds. Government bonds offers added benefits like it's very liquid, it offers a bit of a, defl a deflationary hedge. Um, so we took this opportunity to increase our bond exposures significantly. Um, and we've increased the duration, so we've got longer term bonds than we used to have. So, and the repricing hasn't happened yet, so we think it's, it's, um, it's a good opportunity for the future in terms of, of returns. So very often you see numbers quoted showing the returns of active versus passive. Um, also very often you see that the active managers um, are very unlikely to outperform passive. Uh, there are a few reasons why that's explainable. One would be costs and the other one would be that with an index you let your winners run. So where a portfolio manager would typically trim back on a stock when it gets to, for example, 10% and a stable fund if it gets to even 3% you'd start trimming back. In a passive, um, so in an index you just let those winners, they just run and they can get bigger and bigger. For example, SAB Miller in our index now in our all share index is um, 15 percent so and we think it's a very expensive stock when you invest in the index therefore what's not happening is there's no risk management overlay so the third year I spoke about margin of safety no one's actually checking that the stocks you're investing in aren't potentially very overpriced normally when you let winners run they tend to get expensive in the very long term if you take two extreme examples for example if you bought the Nikkei index in the late 80s, um, you would have done phenomenally well. Active managers would have possibly underperformed horrifically, um, but it all came absolutely crashing down because the multiples were ridiculous. Exactly the same with if you bought tech stocks in the US in 1999, you would have done very, very well if you just bought an index. Um, but as an example, Microsoft is 70 times, great company, the wrong price, and you still haven't made your money back. So when you're buying an index, you must bear in mind that there is no risk management overlay and your return, your risk weighted return is potentially um, not nearly as good as you get from an active manager who's constantly looking at potential drawdown risks and permanent loss of capital risks in the portfolio.